it's difficult to say goodbye. One of the most beautiful things about a really, really good role-playing game is the bittersweet feeling that comes when it ends. Because on the one hand, well done everyone, we've saved the world. Our bonds of friendship have been forged in fire and the story has come to a satisfying conclusion. But on the other hand, the end of a good game that really hooks you, much like a good storybook or a good film or television series, comes with a palpable sense of loss. You can carry the memory of your fictional friends with you, but when the credits roll on a game that means a lot to you, that's it. Game over. With a game like Persona 3, with an ending that is so definite, so fixed, so immutable, there's no logical way for the story to continue anyway. In the case of this specific game, though, Persona 3 approaches the subject of post-game content in a fascinatingly unique manner. One that had me thinking not just about my time with the game itself, but also my own friends, long gone, that I haven't seen in years. Adventures that feel like a lifetime ago, now that I've lived so much longer. Because if the question is, what comes next, then Persona 3's DLC, Episode Aegis, is quite literally the answer. It's no secret that endings are particularly difficult for video games. Yes, there are big controversies like the palpable sense of anti-climax felt by players completing the Mass Effect trilogy. In a very literal sense, it's hard to come up with an ending that ties together hundreds of little choices in a meaningful way. Yes, there are issues around live service games like Destiny, which proclaim to be driven by story, but can't actually give the player a lasting sense of closure for fear that they might, heaven forbid, stop playing, and therefore stop giving the developers money. This is hardly a new problem, though. Go back to the early arcades, and the sheer concept of an ending to a game simply didn't make sense. Why would a game end? The player needs to keep putting money into the machine, which is why games of the 80s just got faster and faster until the player died and tried again. For all that Shigeru Miyamoto gets flack for underplaying the importance of narrative in games, it's worth noting that, unlike many arcade games of the time, his vision of the original Donkey Kong has a definitive ending. The story of this game plays out over four screens, utilizing the Kisho Tenketsu Japanese four-act structure that is prevalent across manga. So, what happens if a player manages to slog through these four stages to the end of Donkey Kong and defeat the game's final boss? A short ending cutscene plays, and then the story starts over. A game can't be allowed to end, not really. The needs of the narrative and the closure that comes from this are secondary to the need to keep the fun coming. Since today's video is about a robot slowly learning to become human, it seems fitting that today's sponsor is a service that teaches humans how to better understand computer programming. Boot.dev is an online learning platform which is designed to tackle the one thing that often gets in the way when making progress as a programmer, boredom. Through engaging hands-on lessons, you're taught the nuances of back-end web development in both the Python and Go programming languages, helping you to make progress in your career and studies. Because the best way to learn this kind of thing is to actually code, Boot.dev's lessons involve a lot of practical challenges to help you practice and practice and practice, all while having fun and enjoying yourself, to help you to level up your programming skills. One thing I really appreciate is the fact that these lessons are gamified with traditional role-playing game elements. You'll earn experience points and unlock achievements as you complete various programming quests, and there's a chance to get onto the global leaderboard. Just between you and me, this feels like one of the most productive and helpful uses of gamification out there at the moment, and I think it is definitely the future of learning. I also appreciate that all of Boot.dev is free to read and watch in the aptly named read-only mode, so even if you can't afford a membership, you can still get something out of the lessons. You only need to pay if you want to get hands-on with the coding assignments yourself, with hints, solutions, progress tracking, and answer verification, and in fairness, you will probably learn a lot quicker that way. If you check out the site and you do like what you see, Boot.dev are offering a 25% discount on either your first month or your first entire year if you sign up for an annual plan. Just use the link in the description or the discount code Video Game Storytime, which also lets them know who sent you. The beginning of episode Aegis is, quite literally, a pity party. A group of friends, all of whom have shared incredible adventures but also heartbreak, are in mourning even as they eat some very expensive sushi. Ostensibly, they're mourning a lost friend, but also they're mourning for each other. Their time in the dorm has come to an end, and many are going their separate ways. The group will never be together again, not like they once were. Indeed, the fracturing has already begun. Two of the group are missing, unwilling to participate. Their fellowship is breaking. In the midst of this nostalgic, lonely, grief-filled final meal, something magical happens. The clocks stop working right. Doorways to the past open up, as memories become real yet again. It's a situation that many people have wished for, 
a chance to freeze a single moment in time, to stop change from coming, to remain in place and bask in the comforting glow of nostalgia. It's also a horror story that has played out many times, a Groundhog Day situation where progress is halted, where life feels like an endless cycle of repetition. So the game asks its central question, would you rather wrap yourself up in nostalgia, like a cocoon, or push forward, knowing that doing so means saying goodbye to places and people that you have loved and now lost? The past or the present? It's not always an easy choice. To have their cake and eat it. Take for example the Legend of Zelda series. Did you defeat the final boss, save Hyrule, rescue the princess? Good job! The end credits roll, and then here you are, right back where you were before you beat the boss. Ostensibly, this is so that you can wander off in another direction, finish side quests you've ignored, squeeze a little more life out of the game. In practice, this means that Hyrule is trapped in perpetual danger. Any victory for the player, any defeat of the game's grand villain, is temporary. This feels particularly horrific in Majora's Mask. No matter what you do, no matter how successful you are at playing the game and rescuing Termina, that three-day cycle will start again the moment you boot up the game. Or take a game like Hades, where every single run ends with death. There is no escape, you are reminded time and time again, even as with each failed run the game portions out just a little more nugget of lore. Some games, such as many of the Pokemon titles, apply a fake-out technique. The credits roll at approximately the halfway point in the game, so that anything that comes afterwards feels like a nice bonus. Ooh, nice, post-game content. To me, the design of Pokemon Black and White let the curtain slip a little too much. What do you mean I've beaten the game? I've clearly only visited half the cities on the map. Or there's a game like Undertale with its branching narratives, which actively encourages you to go again, try another path, do something different, and see what happens. Unless you're like me and do a true pacifist run first, in which case you find yourself guilt-tripped by Sans into not resetting the game and just letting everyone be happy. Or how about a new game plus? You can play through the entire game again, but with some kind of bonus that you didn't have the first time around. Perhaps your stats from the previous playthrough endure, so you're able to take a victory lap, exacting revenge on any boss that ever looked at you funny. All of this means that, in practical terms, for a lot of games, the end of the story isn't really the end of the game anyway. The game doesn't end when the credits roll, the game ends when the player gets bored and stops playing. I've always enjoyed Aegis character design. She's a familiar trope in sci-fi stories, the robot that is a little more human than she is mechanic. There are shades of Bicentennial Man or Deus Ex or even My Life as a Teenage Robot to her, stories that are sometimes cute, sometimes fun, sometimes disturbing and downright unsettling. The thing I love best about her design are her joints. Take a look at her from a distance and Aegis looks perfectly normal, but get up close and see those bendy joints, the empty space where shoulders should be, even the lack of ankles and toes, and you realise that she's a little uncanny by design. She's very literally less than human, there is something missing. Aegis' story, both in Persona 3 and in episode Aegis, is to learn what it means to be alive, to slowly better understand the world around her. I feel like in the base game, the journey is never fully complete. This being a story that turns up so often in fiction, we've seen various shades of it before, and to me, Aegis never feels like she reaches the same level of humanity as the other robots I've just mentioned. She never goes full Robin Williams, or gains the skin coverings that serve as a metaphor for achieving freedom. She's set up as a Pinocchio, but the Blue Fairy never arrives to fully make her a real girl in the base Persona 3 game. Making her the central focus of the game's epilogue, then, wraps up one of the most glaring omissions in my personal favourite Persona game. Sometimes, if a game is really good, you just want a little bit more of it, even if the game took hundreds of hours to complete. It's for this reason that the concept of downloadable content, little tiny slices of extra adventure that come a while after the main game is wrapped up, have proven so popular. Sometimes we as players just want to go back to revisit our imaginary friends one last time. The process of fitting this into a game isn't always very easy though. Sometimes a game's plot needs to be stretched and bent, occasionally to the point of breaking, to accommodate even a single extra scene. In a large number of games, the end of the game also means the end of the protagonist's journey, and finding an excuse to simply bring them back again for a tiny extra adventure takes a bit of head-scratching. Some games will insert extra chapters into the middle. This is inelegant. You've got to go back to a previous save if you've already finished the game, or else start again from scratch. 
Sometimes a game will give you, for example, the son of the character from the main campaign, someone who is depressingly similar to the main protagonist. You get to watch as a new generation makes exactly the same mistakes as the last one. There's nothing really new under the sun. In increasingly rare cases, a game's DLC will go in a wildly different direction entirely, telling an entirely new self-contained story. Something that doesn't require any familiarity with the base game, and therefore has a lot more freedom to be kind of what players have already had, while not being constrained to an existing narrative. Regardless of the approach, DLC invariably ends up feeling like an afterthought. In most cases, I don't really love going back for this extra content. It often ends up feeling superfluous. The story was told, the conclusion was reached. To me, DLC can often end up feeling like this Douglas Adams quote. The storm had now definitely abated, and what thunder there was now grumbled over the more distant hills, like a man saying, and another thing, 20 minutes after admitting he's lost the argument. In my mind then, if you've got an and another thing to add six months down the line, it had better be a pretty good other thing. The developers at Atlas are surprisingly stingy when it comes to the winning formula in Persona games. The thing that sets your Shin Megami Tensei or your Etrian Odyssey apart from Persona, the thing that makes the Persona games sell better than anything else in the Atlas catalogue, is the merging of social simulation with dungeon crawling. This fundamental key to Persona's success, the choice to plan out your days, spend time with whoever you choose, is only available properly in three games – Persona 3, Persona 4, Persona 5. Bear in mind, I haven't played Metaphor Refantasio yet, so I'm just putting that to the side for the moment, maybe I'll come back to that at a later date. Anyway, speaking just about the Persona games, there are a variety of different spin-off Persona titles, and yet none of them ever feature the same time management and social link gameplay that is present in the mainline games. Even games that really feel like they should have this time management mechanic, games that ostensibly feature moving back and forth between the real world and dungeon crawling, such as Tokyo Mirage Sessions FE, fail to really commit to this formula. These games are, I feel, all the poorer for skimping on the grounded daily grind side of the Persona experience. Even the direct sequel to Persona 5, Strikers, refuses to give the player the freedom to live a daily life. Instead, these games, titles like Persona Q and Q2 New Cinema Labyrinth, go hard on the dungeon crawling side of roleplaying, and will occasionally throw the player a bone with a bit of dialogue between a few companion characters. This is true of episode Igis as well. You can't experience daily life, that's part of the plot, the clocks have stopped. And it features in a criticism that I've seen of the epilogue, that this is just an endless dungeon crawl that feels like more of the same. And I won't lie to you, I played this on story mode. I had no extra time for dungeon crawling unnecessarily. At the same time, I feel like there's a benefit to taking the focus away from the player character from the main Persona 3 game. That the emphasis is so heavy on the game's companion characters means that you get a far better look at who they are when the blank slate player insert character that is the Persona 3 protagonist is nowhere to be seen. Here the characters are not defined by their relationship to the player, while simultaneously being unable to stop talking about them. There's a greater scope for infighting and camaraderie. These characters are free to express jealousy and support, resentment and respect, to be petty and self-sacrificing and argumentative and forgiving. The nice thing about taking out all of the player's agency in the story is that all the other characters gain greater autonomy in its absence. Persona 3 is beautifully written throughout, but I don't think there are any moments in the base game where these characters feel quite so nuanced and complex and downright alive as they feel in episode Igis, which given Igis' own personal arc is incredibly fitting. I don't remember whose idea it was, but it was probably Gemma's. We were all together one last time. In just two days, I was going to board a plane heading back to my childhood home. It was the final few days of my time at Hong Kong Baptist University. My bags were packed, my goodbyes were said, I'd even left a box of chocolates for my horrible roommate, along with a note apologizing for, well, being me. My friends and I were all together for one last meal. It was definitely a last supper moment. The end of the school year meant that many of us were soon heading back to our various countries of origin around the world. I don't know how the subject came up. I mentioned in passing that the one thing I'd really wanted to do before leaving, but hadn't had the time to, was hike up to the top of Lion Rock before dawn and watch the sun rise over Hong Kong Island. I'd done it once before, and the thought of doing it again had never really left me. So someone, I assume Gemma, said, why don't we do it? We've still got time, let's have one last adventure. 
So we did. Christy volunteered the floor of her apartment and we slept there for the night all together, although in practice I doubt we did much actual sleeping. Then at around 4 or 5 a.m. we called some taxis, which dropped us off at the foot of the mountain, and up we went. I went first up the mountain. I was the only one that knew the way, especially in the dark. Plus, I was a fast hiker, and crucially, I wanted to make sure to break the cobwebs before any of the others even knew that there were cobwebs to break. Hong Kong has some very big spiders. And then we were at the top, and the sun came up just like it always did with the purple hue rising from the mist beneath the mountains, and it looked exactly like every traditional Chinese painting that you've ever seen. And there we were, my little group of friends, on top of the world, sharing my absolute favourite view in all the world. One last final adventure together. Once we'd had our fill, we hiked back down, shared taxis back to the train line. We said goodbye one by one until it was just Gemma and me left. With one final hug, we walked away in opposite directions. We'd see each other a few more times over the years back in England, and it would always be like no time at all had passed, but if I'm honest, I'm not very good at keeping in touch with friends that are out of my immediate line of sight. I slept for a few hours, and then I, along with everyone else in the dorm, tried to take my suitcases down to the ground floor so I could make my way slowly to the airport. After 20 minutes of waiting in frustration for an empty lift, I ended up carrying my bags down 13 flights of stairs, and then I left. It didn't feel like an ending. It was a beginning. I was finally going to be living on the same continent as the love of my life, and it wasn't long before we were married, before we had children, before we started this YouTube channel. It's been well over 10 years now. The details are hazy, but the feelings remain. The social simulator side of the Persona games has always been the unique selling point that has appealed the most to me. I'm always so impressed with how well these games are written, how believable their characters feel. Getting to play through Persona 3 again, my favourite of the lot, with Reload has been a real treat, like coming back to revisit old friends. Playing episode Aegis hits different though. I admit that having played Persona 3 on the PSP rather than on the PS3, I've never actually played the answer before, so this story was all new to me. There's a reason why, after finishing episode Aegis, my next thought was to look up my photos from that trip to the top of Lion Rock. Why I found myself disappearing down a rabbit hole on Facebook, a site that I hardly ever use anymore, finding out what happened to some of the people that were there with me that day. Persona 3 episode Aegis is about how time cannot stand still. The clock always keeps ticking, even when you think it's run out. It's about how we can get trapped in our own memories, in a wish for the past, in a desire to relive the glory days or change our regrets. We can spend our entire lives trapped, missing the people that have made a lasting impression on us, unable to move on. The moral of episode I guess is that it's okay to let things go, to allow chapters of our lives to close. When games are at their best, they don't just entertain or distract, they reflect our lives and help us to understand ourselves better. This is why episode I guess matters.